All right, all right. Good morning, you guys. It's good to see y'all today. Um, so as Emma read for us, we're going to be in um, 1 John uh, chapter 5 today, beginning um, our last chapter in uh, the letter of 1 John. And so um, we've talked about a lot of things in this, um, in this short letter, but one thing John has said over and over and over again And that is that he wants his readers to understand that they can know, they can have confidence, they can be unshakable in their conviction that they belong to God and that there is eternity that is promised for them. And this hope, this hope of a life after this, this hope of eternity with Jesus is something that should give confidence to all believers. It should give hope to all believers. It should um, cause each one of us that has put our faith and trust in Jesus um, to have an enduring hope no matter what we go through in this life. And that's exactly where John begins in chapter 5. He comes back to this idea of overcoming the world, right? And I think what John is picking up on is is a question that many of us have asked, or maybe we are in the middle of asking that question right now. And that question is this, how do I make it through this life? How do I make it through this life into the next? How do I make it through all that it means to live this life, all it means to to live in this world? And John's answer to that question is, Right? The secret to overcoming this life and getting through this life and having victory in this life, the answer is, as John says, to be born of God. And then he lays out four different indicators or marks of what it means to be born of God. Now, a couple of these we've covered in great detail over uh, the past few weeks. John uh, loves his repetition. Right? He loves just saying the same thing over and over again to drive it in so that you get that point. And so we're going to move quickly through the first two, and then we're going to hang out on the last two, because I think that's, uh, he picks up on a few things that um, I think are really important for us to understand. Right? And as I was thinking about this idea of getting through, right, um, it reminded me, I was actually here um, at Christian Heritage a few weeks ago for their Spiritual Emphasis Week. And for their spiritual emphasis week, they were looking at Ephesians chapter 6, where Paul lays out um, the spiritual armor, the armor of God, that we can equip ourselves with um, in order to stand against the enemy. And one of the the ideas that we picked up on as we were talking about that battle, uh, about the spiritual battle, was that most of us, right, most of us don't even find ourselves in the battle because we don't realize that we are warriors in battle. The midst of a spiritual battle. In fact, if I were to guess this morning when you woke up and rolled out of bed, right, as we all do, at some point we find ourselves in front of a mirror, right? And for most of us, when we're standing in front of that mirror, we don't say, I am a warrior, yes! Now, my boys, I wholeheartedly believe every time they look into the mirror, that's what they see right? And most of the time they come out of the house with weapons ready to go into a battle. But for most of us, right, we look in that mirror and we see some version of someone who is defeated, who's been beat up by whatever life has thrown at them that day or that week or maybe that season of life. And what John is encouraging us as believers in Jesus that there is a hope that we can live in to overcome this life to overcome this world. And this hope is what I want us to focus in on today. All right? So I want to pray for our time, and then I want to jump right into these first couple of marks of being a child of God. So pray with me this morning. Father, it is an honor and a privilege, God, that we can be joined with you this morning, God. I just, as I I think about this morning, God, brothers and sisters across the world, God, as I was at a training yesterday, a missionary training yesterday, just hearing about the work you're doing, God, I think about this morning, Father, brothers and sisters that are in uh, Africa, the continent of Africa, God, especially those toward the north 
part of that continent who God have had to pull out their missionary presence this morning are not able to meet openly or share the name of Jesus openly this morning because of the level of persecution. And so, Father, as we are grateful this morning to have the freedom to, to be able to, to proclaim the name of Jesus openly and boldly, Father, we do want to remember those who aren't able to do that this morning. Yet, for the sake of the gospel, God, they are still boldly, boldly sharing the name of Jesus. And so, Father, we pray that you would be with them this morning, God, be with us this morning as we open your word. I pray that, God, through the power of your Holy Spirit, God, that it would illuminate, that it would open our eyes and open our hearts to, to your word this morning, God. Specifically this morning as we look at how do we overcome this world? How do we overcome the obstacles and challenges in this life? And how do we come out on the other end, Father, um, in a place of, of victory, God? Not of defeat, but of victory because of what you've done for us. And so it is in the name of Jesus we pray these things. Amen. Mark number one, John says, is that if we believe that Jesus is the Messiah, that is the first mark of being born of God. He says everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ. Everyone who believes, right? So this is an inclusive term. It means that not everyone believes this. But those who believe that are children of God. Right? I love what Adrian Rogers said about this. He said, the assurance of my salvation comes not from the fact that I did trust in Christ, but that I am trusting in Christ for my salvation. You see, it's an active trust. It's not something, it's not a prayer that we prayed when we were young or at some point in our life or when we were in some spiritual high moment. But, it, but the picture here is a constant trust, a constant confession, a constant believing that Jesus is is the Christ. And that word Christ there, it's a, it's a Greek phrase that goes back to a Hebrew phrase, Messiah. And that Hebrew phrase, Messiah, is just loaded with all kinds of meaning that we don't have time to get into that, to today. But essentially it means the anointed one, the promised one. We can trace the roots back of that word all the way back to King David. God made a promise to King David that one would come in his line there would be a king. He would have a kingdom that would not end, and one would come from his line. But in fact, we could actually trace it back even further. If we go back to Abraham and the promise that God made to Abraham, that God would make him a great nation, and that he would be a blessing to the whole world. But in fact, we can actually go back even further. If we go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, a passage that we studied last year, if we go back to Genesis 3 in the garden, when Adam and Eve had been defeated by sin, right? God makes a promise in the midst of that. He said, one day the seed of woman will come who will crush the head of the serpent, right? It's a promised one that we've been waiting for literally since the beginning of humanity. They would come and they would right all of the wrongs. And so what John is saying is we believe that Jesus is that one, that long-awaited Savior that we've been waiting for. And we're putting our hope into that fact. And so John says, if you believe this, you've been born of God. I love that phrase that John uses there, born of God. It makes me, it reminds me of, of John chapter 3, right, where Jesus is talking to a Pharisee named Nicodemus. You guys remember that moment? right? Um, people have called him Nick at night, right? Because he came, some of you guys are way too young to get that joke. Some of you are like, I remember, right? Go look it up, Nick at night. It was a whole thing back in the like late 90s. Um, but Nicodemus came to Jesus at night. He was ashamed. He was afraid to come to him during the day because he was a Pharisee. But he asked Jesus a question. He said, what do you have to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, you must be born again. And Nicodemus looked at Jesus and asked a really good question. He said, how can I go back into my mother's womb? Smart man Nicodemus was, right? And Jesus looks at him and he says, no, 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 right? It's, it, it's a spiritual rebirth, right? But the picture there is as, as we are born again, it, we're not the same person that we've been changed. We're going to celebrate baptism here in just a few weeks. And it's literally a picture, right? As, as the person goes into the water, it's a picture of them dying to the old self, and as they come out of the water, it's a new person. They've been raised to new life in Christ. And I love this picture that John is painting for us. 
So first of all, we must believe that Jesus is Messiah. Number two, and John's talked about this over and over again, we must, lo- we must have a love for God's other children. He says this in the second part of verse 1. He says, And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. He loves his other children, right? Everyone who loves God, you can't love God and not love his children. As a parent, we get this intuitively, right? Like, you can love me all day, but if you've got a problem with one of my kids, you've really got a problem with me, right? Like, any parent in the room would say the exact same thing. And God as the, as the good father, right? He's reminding us that we must also have love for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, we may not be able to do this perfectly, right? But this should be our hope. This should be our desire is that we grow more and more in the love of this. And John has talked about this love for brother, love for sister in Christ over and over again. So then we get to Mark number three, and this is one of the ones we want to hang out on for just a bit today. Mark number three is that we joyfully keep his commandments. Listen to verse two and three. But this we know that the love, I'm sorry, by this we know that we love the children of God. When we love God and obey his commandments, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. There's so much to unpack here. All right, first note that there are two concepts that are at play here, right? I think I I highlighted them, yep. He says, first of all, if we were to love the children of God, if we were to to be children of God, we must first love God, but see how this is connected with his and here, and obey his commandments. You see, for John, as he thinks about what it means to love God, it's these two concepts that are intricately tied together, right? Right? In, in other words, what John is saying is that we can't love God and then not do what he has called us to do. As Ross said a few weeks ago, obedience is the love language of God. Now, obedience is not required for salvation. God loves us as we are. God loves us ever before we're able to love him. When we are still dead in our trespasses and sin, God showed his love toward us, right? In that while we were still dead... Before we could ever move toward God, he made that first move toward us. But as ones who are recipients of God's love, the way that we show our love to God, right, is by obedience. Is that we follow his commands. John's kind of doing something similar to what he did last week in our passage. If you remember last week in our passage, we were looking at the love of God. How God could love us and why God would love us. And we saw that, first of all, love came from God, but then secondly, God also proved his love by sending Jesus. Here's the verse. Let me just read it for you, just as a way of reminder. John, 1 John 4, 9 and 10 says, In this the love of God was made manifest to us, that God sent his only Son into the world, so that we might live through him. In this love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us, and sent his Son to be a propitiation for our sins. You see, God sent Jesus to prove, to show his love. And so what John's saying right now in this passage in chapter 5 is, if we want to show our love to God, right, that comes through obedience. The proof of our love for God, right? When, when the rubber meets the road in our life, if we really want to get beyond just saying that we love God, it's by obeying his commandments. That's what this passage is reminding us of. And then John goes and just jacks the whole thing up. You see what he says? Can we get back to that? Uh, to, um, no, go back to 5, 2, and 3. Yep, right there. Right? So for most of us, we can read this. We can read verse 2 and say, yeah, like, okay, I grew up in church. I grew up in Sunday school. I've heard this Jesus thing. We love God. We obey his commandments. I know there's 10 that are really important that we should probably do, right? Some version of that, I'm good, right? And I can just kind of bear my way through life and do these things. And then we get to the end of verse three, and John just jacks the whole thing up for us. And, th- and his commandments, he says, are not burdensome. Just sit with that for just a second this morning. Is that your heart posture? Are you able to say that this morning? 
that I can love God, and as I love him and I, and I follow him, his commandments are not burdensome. At this point, many of us are wondering, is this even possible? And I'm with you, all right? In fact, here's a few little stats, okay? <clears throat> In the Old Testament, there are 613 commands, okay? 613. In the New Testament, there are 1,050 different commands. So I'm not great at math, but I use my calculator, put it together, we got 1663. 1663 commandments in this book. And John looks at that and says, yeah, that shouldn't be burdensome to you, right? What in the world? More than that, when Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment, right? Jesus says, I'll give you two, love God and love people. And I don't know about you, but I struggle just doing two of those well, right? I mean, as I think back through my week, there's been points where I've not loved God or loved people well throughout the week. And those are just two of the 1,663 commands. How in the world is John saying that this should not be a burden to us? I think this is the secret, though. When you love someone, serving them should not be a burden. Right? Think about this, right? One thing that I've learned, so Nicole and I have been married for 12 years, okay? One of the things that I've learned in the 12 years that has been the most helpful is that uh, Nicole and I, we communicate our love in different ways, right? We have different love languages, if you will. I am physical touch to the 10th degree, and then words of affirmation, right? Like, like I want to know that you love me. I want to hear it. I want to be consoled and I want to be hugged and snuggled. Like that's who God has made me to be. But for her, right, her love language, number one, maybe number one, two, three, four, and five are acts of service. She wants to see me loving her by, by showing her the way that I love her, by serving her, right? And so years ago, we for, I forgot, you know, I forget the flowers and the candy and all that sort of stuff, right? I just got to wash some dishes. You know what I mean? I got to just take the kids out of the house for a little bit and give mama some quiet time alone. She's also a quality time person, and that quality time sometimes is time alone. Some of the moms in this room get that, what I mean, right? But the way that I show her that I love her is by the acts of service, And when I'm doing that out of a place of love, that shouldn't be a burden. I shouldn't begrudgingly do things for her. And I'm like, oh, I got to do this because oh, I guess I love this woman. So I got to do, you know, that's not the attitude, right? It should come out of, a, out of a desire, out of a heart to love her. And that's exactly what I think the key of what John is saying here. When we truly love God... Following him and obeying him should not be burdensome to us. I think this is what Jesus picks up on when he says in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 and 29, he says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Notice this. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light, right? Jesus can say this to people who are burdened by life because, yes, Jesus has obedience as a part of what it means to follow him, right? But when we do that out of a place of love, then that yoke is easy. Jesus walks with us. He yokes with us as we walk through the burdens of life. Pastor um, in um, Portland, Oregon, a guy named John Mark Comer says this way. He says, an easy life is, isn't an option, but an easy yoke is, right? As John is writing to fellow believers, right? Just imagine what they're going through in this moment. And John's saying, you know what? Life isn't easy, but if we love God, there's a burden that is light when we follow after him. There should be a joy in serving God, Right? It's, it's kind of like that idea, right? When we love something, we don't mind putting the work in to showing the thing that we love, do we? I mean, think about it. Most of the things that we really, truly love and enjoy, 
requires some level of work, right? And we don't often complain about the work when we actually love that thing. So one of the things that I love is the Green Bay Packers. And I want to just tell you this morning, because I have a microphone, I want to tell you why I love the Packers. And you got to sit there and listen to it. And maybe, just maybe, if the Spirit is moving this morning, right, maybe you'll be convinced to love the Packers as well. There are two reasons. Number one, okay, number one is history. The Green Bay Packers are the only team in the NFL that are not owned by, sh- that are owned by shareholders, by individuals, not by private owners. I think we got, a bit, we got a picture up here, Sam, and we need to put that picture up there. That one right there, right? So that dude right there can say, you know what, I am an owner of an NFL team because he's a shareholder, and he may only own one share, right? But it's equally distributed among shareholders. That's why I love the Packers. It's not just one really old rich dude, right, who, who owns everything and makes horrible decisions. Sorry if you are a Dallas Cowboy fan. That is your life, okay? But the second reason I love the Packers is because of their fans. Their fans are loyal. Since 1960, we go on to the next slide, Sam. Since 1960, season tickets have been sold out. Currently, the expected wait list is 30 years to get season tickets to the Green Bay Packers. Okay? I hope my mom bought them when I was a baby. Um, but I, from that look on her face, it looks like I'm not getting season tickets. With over 130,000 names tallied on the waiting list. This is due to the massive fan base that the Packers enjoy, as well as their nonprofit status, because they're not owned by one person. But the other reason that I love the fans is that they are insane. I think we got one more slide up here. Yes, um, of some of our faithful Green Bay fans, right? So, the cold does not keep them away, right? The field they play on is called Lambeau Field. Does anybody know what the other name for that is? Is that kind of the nickname for Lambeau Field? Anybody? The Frozen Tundra. Same can read. Good job, buddy. The frozen tundra, right? And the reason is because oftentimes when they're playing, they don't have a dome. They play in an open field, right? And the cold does not keep them away. In fact, in 1967, the Packers played the very first ever Super Bowl against the Cowboys that saw temperatures dip to negative 48 degrees Fahrenheit with wind chill that made the number somewhere around negative 70 degrees. Still, the Packers came away victorious, right? This is why I love the Packers. I mean, look at this dude. Like, he's drinking out of a heat bottle, um, right? I, I, I'm not endorsing this, kids. That is not a good idea. I'm sure that's really not what's in there, um, right? Here's the deal, though, All right? Those fans, right, those fans that are sitting in the stadium, they're not sitting in there complaining that they're at a Green Bay Packers game at negative 48 degrees, Right? They are excited. They're pumped up. They're loving the fact that they get to be a part of this. And yet, I wonder, right? We get to know the God of the universe. And yet, when God calls us to live a certain way, to do certain things that are really for our own benefit, what is our heart response to that? I know for me, a lot of times, it's complaining. It's begrudging. It's Okay, I'm going to do this because I have to, right? But can we say, as John is encouraging us, that his commandments are not burdensome, right? So I want to hang out. I want you guys to hang out with this for just a second, right? We're going to have our discussion question right here. Here's the question. What is an activity, hobby, or task that takes work but is not a burden? And why do you find this work not burdensome? (coughs) And how can obeying God be seen in the same way? So um, if you guys want to just divide up in some groups uh, around you, you guys talk about that. Uh, Nicole and I will be in the back with the kids today, and we'll be talking about this same idea. So let's take about five minutes, and we'll come back and jump into this last uh, mark of following Jesus. All right, so we just talked about the idea of of how we can have joy and obedience, right? That's the third mark. Here's the fourth mark, right? This is, this is kind of the, the main theme of this passage that John's writing to us. And it's this perseverance of our faith. <clears throat> Beginning in verse 4 through 5 says this, For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. 
Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God, right? Here's our last mark, that we must persevere, right? In fact, I think what John is writing to us as believers is that, is that if we persevere to the end, if we don't give up, if we hold on to our faith, if we fight this battle, then in the end, we win. Now, that sounds pretty simple, doesn't it? In fact, many of us would say that that sounds too simple, right? But you see, the problem is that it's not just about what's easy, right? It's about what is to come, right? It's, it's the hope that we have, right? Do you really think, right? What does John say here? He says that the victory that has overcome the world is our faith, right? Do you believe that? Do you hold on to that? Do you, do you really believe what John is saying here? That, that our faith is what is going to be the thing that gives us victory over the world in the end, right? And so think about this for just a second, right? As John is writing this, think about his context. Okay, we talked about this week one when we began 1 John, right? But what we know is that there was a group probably a pretty good-sized group within the church. Maybe even some of the leadership or the financial supporters of the church left the church because they no longer believed that first mark, that Jesus was the Son of God. <coughs> and so they left the church, and they started teaching this false doctrine. And so John is in this context, right? Can you imagine as he's writing this? To, to being in the midst of a church that is broken right now because of what's just happened. And that's just inside the church. Outside of the church, the church was being persecuted by the Romans. It was illegal for them to be followers of Jesus. Brothers and sisters, people that John was writing to, knew people who had probably died or had been in prison for their faith. And this persecution continued for the next hundred years or so. And John is still writing to them and saying, you know what, our faith, our faith is what gives us victory. Now, we don't face that level of persecution in our lives today. But anyone who is probably over the age of 30 this morning realizes that there has become an increased persecution even in the West, right? In fact, in, the, in, in 50 years ago, the majority of our country would at least have identified as Christian, right? And they would have seen being a Christian as a good thing. More and more of our world today is starting to look at Christianity with more than just skeptical opinions, but they're actually saying, that's actually a bad thing. And they're starting to equate it with more and more. And certainly this is the trajectory of the world that we live in. And John is writing, and I think his words are just as applicable to us today in 2023 as it was to this early church. That we must hold on, that we must hold fast, and that it is our faith that will overcome this world. And certainly John is not the only one of Jesus' followers to have this opinion. In fact, I just want to read a few of Jesus' other followers who wrote with this same mindset. First of all, Peter, in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5-8, through 8, he says this, For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness. That word steadfastness can also be endurance or perseverance. And steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul's saying we need to, I mean, Peter's saying we need to put on perseverance so that we won't be ineffective in the call that God has placed on our lives. Paul, in 2 Timothy, this is Paul's last letter that he writes as he's in prison waiting to die for his faith. He writes this. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. And listen to his words. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. I've endured. I've held on to the faith 
Henceforth there is a crown, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all those who love his appearance. James, the half-brother of Jesus, the first leader of the Jerusalem church, writes this in James chapter 1, verses 2-4. through four. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect. That you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Holding on to our faith. Finally, the pastor of the Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 12 verses 1 through 3 says this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against themselves, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. How do we become victorious over this world? Our faith in Jesus, my friends. It's holding on. Our faith is the key. You see, everyone has faith, right? Everyone has faith. Everyone born into this world has some faith in something. We are people who need something to believe in. We are people, as we said last week, that have a God-shaped vacuum or God-shaped hole inside of our souls that we are longing to fill it with something, right? And some people in this world, right, have faith, right? There are some that say that they're just spiritual, And they put their faith that their spirituality, whatever that may mean, however undefinable that may be, is all that they need. For the person who has faith in a God that promises Godhood to them has faith. The person who puts their faith in a God that bases your salvation on your good works has a lot of faith. And the atheist who says there is no God puts their faith in their own intellect and science to prove that faith. In fact, I would submit to you this morning that the atheist probably actually has more faith than the Christian does. Because at the bottom of the argument for the one who says that there is no God and all that you see is all that there is, is really having to put themselves at the bottom of that to say, you know what, I'm smart enough, I'm intelligent enough to figure out all the intricacies of this world. And I believe that there is nothing there. But you see, what atheism lacks in their faithful attempt to explain the world apart from God, the one thing that they lack to offer is hope. I mean, think about it for a second. If we were to submit our minds to an atheistic worldview of the world, where is there any place for hope in that picture? Right? We live in a meaningless world for a very short amount of time. And when it's over, that's all that there is. You see, there's no place for hope. Last week, we quoted Richard Dawkins, who said that at the bottom of the universe is just pitiless indifference, right? The universe doesn't care about you. And so there's no reason to have hope because there, at the end, is nothing Which leads us to our apologetic question we want to look at today. And the question is this, why do we believe, or why should you believe that the Christian worldview over an atheistic worldview? And instead of going into scientific facts and things that the Bible has said that science has later proven, there's there's a whole argument for that, right? I want to argue from the point of hope. I want to argue from the point of meaning and purpose. Because I believe that the Christian worldview offers a meaning and purpose that we find nowhere else. So I'm going to make a few comparisons, okay? First of all, when we look at the Christian worldview, we were created with a purpose. God said, let us make man in our own image. 
and let them have dominion over this. There's a purpose. God wired that purpose into our creation. But on the atheistic worldview, essentially we account for just a cosmic accident, a random scientific event that we can't explain why it happened or why it hasn't happened again. But just randomly, somehow, there were some atoms out there that collided together and we get everything. And so at the end, you're nothing but a cosmic accident. On the Christian worldview, we find a value because you were made by a loving, sovereign creator in his image. And so you have value. And not only do you have value, but those other human beings have value because God said that you should love them and that they are made in his image. On a purely atheistic worldview, right? And I, I don't actually think anybody actually thinks this way because I don't think that you could think this way in general and actually make it in the world. But at the, but at the base level, right, but just, a, just a, a bare bones look at the atheistic, atheistic worldview, it would say that you are only as valuable as much as you can contribute to someone else, right? You don't have intrinsic value necessarily in yourself, but you're valuable as far as it goes to helping someone else. On the Christian worldview, the intricacies of the universe are proof of an all-powerful creator, right? The, the atoms and the things that we're learning about the universe and the intricacies and the, and the fact that the, the earth is on a rotation that rotates just a certain way and if it was off by just a, a fraction of a degree that life couldn't be sustained. For the Christian worldview, we look at that and we say, God is a beautiful, brilliant, beautiful mind creator that created this perfect world for us. In the atheistic worldview, these intricacies of the universe are a mystery, but necessary, so they must be seen as random. In the Christian worldview, the way I treat others matters because a moral God has told me how to treat them, and they are valued because they are made in his image. Like we talked about last week. God has put morals in this world and said that these things are good. This way that you treat people is good, and we can find that in God. Atheistic worldview, the way we treat others, again, is how it should benefit me, right? If, if we would subscribe to what Darwin, Darwin would call the survival of the fittest, right? If, if you do something for me and that somehow helps me survive better, then that's great, right? I see that as a value, and I can value you as far as that goes. But at the same time, if I can somehow push you down to get ahead and that's actually better for me, then I'm okay with that too because really it's just about survival. It's just about getting by. You see, it doesn't provide a means for the moral grounds that we, that we all intricately feel inside of us. You see, ultimately at the end, and this is not my words, this is words from atheist. They said that we are nothing but stardust flesh bags, steaming chemicals. That is how we should look at ourselves. We're just DNA walking around. We somehow figured out how to communicate with each other. But finally and most importantly, when I look at the Christian worldview, it provides a future that is determined by Jesus who has already made a way for me. Right? It provides a hope, a sure hope and foundation for the life to come. And yet, when we look at the atheistic worldview, there is no future, there is no hope, there is no life to come, because in reality, what you see is what you get, and that's all that there is. And so the best that you can hope to experience is the best that this world can offer. And let me just plead with you this morning, right? If you've thought this way, or you know someone who thinks this way, there is something so much better. There's a hope that is so much better than the brokenness of the world that we live in. And so hope today that we have a future, that we have a promise, we have something to look forward to. And yet, we also know that in this life, it's hard at times when we're going through those trials. 
when we're going through the, the hard parts and it feels like the world and life is just overcoming us. And you may say, Rustin, what do I do practically in that moment? Like, yes, I know I need to have a, a hope in Jesus. I know I need to, to have a hope in the future. I know that it's my faith. But practically, what does that look like in this life? And I want to bring us back to that passage in Hebrews that we looked at just a second ago. Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. And I want to point out just one thing that I would hope that you would walk away from today. It's right there in verse 2. It says, looking to Jesus the founder and perfecter of our faith. If our faith is going to overcome the world, the one thing that we can do to hold on, to strengthen that faith in the face of everything that we endure in this world is look to Jesus, right? Look to Jesus. Look what it says. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Jesus went through trials. Jesus went through hard stuff. Jesus went through the cross. Jesus was obedient to the Father's will when he was here on this earth. And yet it says, for the joy that was set before him. So I want to encourage you today as we, as we think about God's commandments and following after God, that we would be able to, to mimic Jesus in our lives, that we would be able to do that with joy. I would ask you, where does your joy come from? This week, when you are asked to love the unlovable, will it be with joy? When you are asked to give something that you don't have, will it be with joy? When you are, all, when you are asked to sacrifice something that you want to hold on to for someone else, will it be with joy? Dads, when your kids ask you to go out and play this week, and you'd rather sit down and kick your feet up because you're tired, can you serve with joy? Husbands, can we love our wives with joy? Kids, when your parents ask you to do something, can it be with joy? Teens in the room, when your parents ask you to do something, can you do it with joy? Not necessarily because we love the thing that they're asking us to do, but because it's a way to show our obedience to God, to show our love to God by the way that we respond. And that joy would be the overflow of our hearts, right? Not just that we do it begrudgingly, but that we could do it in joy. Here's the question. Is your natural response to God's asking, is it joy? Right? It's not that I have to do this, but I get to be a part of what God is asking me to do. But secondly, notice what it says. We go back to that Hebrews passage again one more time. He says, consider him, right? So verse 2 and verse 3 kind of start the same way. Look to Jesus, consider him who what? Who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. You think you get persecuted, right? Go back and read the Gospels. In our Gospel reading this week, we're at the very end of John. We're about to go to the point where Jesus is taken to the cross. I would encourage you to go and just read that passage this week. And you think that the persecution you're getting is something? Look at how they treated Jesus. They treated him with hostility against the God and the king of this universe. Yet it says that he endured all of that. Why? You ever seen this? So that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. Do you realize that when Jesus was on the cross, as he was hanging there in pain and suffering, that you were what he had on his mind. That's what John's saying. I mean, that's what the author of Hebrews is saying. That he endured these things so that you may not grow weary. So that we would have an example of what to do when life gets hard. You see, when our faith is hard, do we focus in on the sufferings of Jesus? Do we endure the same way that he does? Maybe here's a question who or what do we run to when things get difficult? Is it other people? Is it an addiction? Is it a possession? Is it isolation? Is it checking out? Is it pity from others? Or do we consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted? 
See, our last question, our last application question is, is Jesus your natural response to difficulty? Because we're all going to go through it, right? We're all going to go through it. The only way we can go through it well is by looking to Jesus, considering Jesus, consider how Jesus lived his life. Look to Jesus this week, church. Look to Jesus and allow the joy of obedience to flow out of our hearts and allow our faith to be the victory over the world this week. Let me, let me pray for, uh, for you this week and then our worship team is going to come and lead us in one last song of response. Father, I pray this week for our church community. I pray, Father, that you would help us to be people who endure well. God, that we would, with joy, live in obedience. That our faith would persevere to the end. God, that we would not be known for how smart we are, or how funny we are, or how intellectual we are, but we would be known for how faithful we are. Our faith holds in the midst of the storms of life, in the persecution, in the trials, in the midst of it all, God, that we would, we would hold fast to Jesus, that we would look to him, God, that we would consider the way that he lived and endured in this life, God, so that we could do the same. So God, give us, give us the mind this week to think this way. God, give us the Give us the, the, the heart and the spirit this week. God, the desire this week to live that way. God, and give us the strength this week for whatever we're going through. God, I know in, in, in this room, God, that there are people going through the myriad of things right now in their own life. God, probably many of those things that they haven't shared with another person. But I ask this week, God, that you would give them the strength to endure faithfully looking to Jesus, considering Jesus every step of the way as we walk this week. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.